All right. So we're continuing our lecture. This is lecture two on, uh, um, as we're studying through the book of Revelation. So we're going to pick up now in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 16 onwards. So what we said was, um, there is this beast, the first beast, who is the Antichrist. Uh, and he has, you know, he has started speaking blasphemies against God and uh, all of that. And people are beginning to worship him. And uh, then comes the false prophet. He's um, doing signs, he is doing signs and wonders and he's preaching and deceiving people. And his goal is to get people to worship the first beast, the Antichrist. And in order to do that, he comes up with this image of the beast that, you know, that is getting everybody to worship. Um, so we so should be saying there's a one world leader, a world leader. There is a world religious leader. So there's a world political leader, a world religious leader. The world political leader is the Antichrist. The world religious leader is the false prophet. And the false prophet has introduced this world religious system, getting a people everywhere to worship the beast. But what we also see here you know, in verses 16 through 18 is there's a world financial system, or some people use the term uh, economic, a global economic system, or they may even use the term a one world currency. Uh, it doesn't actually have to be physical currency, but it's a means by which people are able to transact financially. Because he says in verse 16, he causes all, whether you're rich or poor, great or small, slave or free, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. This is Revelation 13, 16. So he says, you know, you've got to receive this mark. Uh, and this mark is something that is put on the body. So how it's put on the body, you know, we don't know exactly. Uh, we don't have to worry too much about that. Of course, there's technology available these days, whether it's going to be mm, some sort of a microchip implant or whether it's some sort of a... a you know, there's just so many ways to go about something like this. But he causes people to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Now, this mark is not any ordinary mark. Verse 17 says, you cannot buy or sell except if you have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So you cannot buy or sell. That this has to do with financial transactions. You can't buy anything. You can't sell. You can't engage economically uh, in the market. So that's why people use the term of one world currency. That means you can't buy or sell unless you have this. Okay. Or you can't engage uh, financially unless you have this. Unless you have the mark or the name, or the number. So unless you have the mark, the name, or the number, right? So um, we could try and imagine how this thing is introduced. So basically, what we know is it's something on the on the on the right hand or on the forehead. So that means it is something that is put on the person. So it's not like an ID, physical ID card uh, that we carry. Now we are used to carrying ID cards or credit cards. I mean, and of course, we use credit cards for engaging in transactions. But this is going one level closer to the human body than carrying a credit card. It's something that is put upon the forehead or on the right hand. 
and that represents the mark, the name, or the number of the beast, the Antichrist. And unless you have that imprint or implant, whatever, whatever form it's going to be, you can't transact financially, can't buy yourself. So it's some sort of a control on the economic system, on the financial system that this Antichrist introduces. Now, if you think about it, given the technology that we have today, something like this is very possible. You know, if you just go back maybe 50 years, you know, you say like, how is this going to be possible? How are you going to be able to, you know, it says here, everybody and it is causing people everywhere globally to do this if you go back in time 50 years well how, uh, you know you'd be wondering how could that be possible how could you do this not practically possible here we are 50 years later it is possible um, that uh, given all the technology we have given all you know the advances in electronics and so on yeah it's possible uh, what exactly the technology will be that is used for this don't worry you know whatever is available at that time will be, of course be used but the technology is available where we can do this right uh, so what we have seen here is this and then and then again don't worry about the number 666 you know uh, his number it says you know verse 18 says we do must understand and calculate the number of the beast it is the number of a man his number is 666 so whether he literally and actually uses 666 or some version of that number you know it's okay why well, you don't have to worry about it but John was given this information and we can see how it plays out. It may be literally, he will say, have 666 as my number and everybody has to have this 666 number on their foreheads or on their hand for to transact or some form, some variation of it. You know, how it's actually played out. Uh, we don't have to worry, but I'm sure that at that time, when it is being done, People reading Revelation 13 will be able to identify it. Say, hey, exactly what Revelation 13 said is happening. We'll be able to identify it. Okay. So he's given us verse 18, says, you know, have this understanding. Calculate the number. So there is some sort of a mathematical formula involved here. Calculate the number of the beast. It's the number of a man. His number is 666. So this number of the beast, which is being imprinted through some calculation, is going to arrive at 666. Uh, what exactly that is, we don't know right now. Uh, you know, there, there have been a lot of, uh, lot of uh, speculation around this, you know. Uh, people would take the name of a certain religious leader and then they will do this translation of his first name and middle name and last name into, you know, a numerical equivalent and it arrives at 666 and says, look, that man is the Antichrist and all these things. And uh, none of it, you know, really uh, came, you know, into fulfillment. So uh, I think we shouldn't what, speculate at this point. We can be sure enough that um, when it is happening, people can correlate. They'll be able to say, hey, John wrote in Revelation 13, 18, calculate the number of the beast. And they will be able to see it, that you can actually determine that that whatever number he is using is going to come up as 666. Right? So 
I don't know what there's a barcode that's imprinted. And if you look at the barcode carefully, it'll come out as 666. Or I, I, we don't know. But uh, we have the information here. So Revelation 13, to sum it up, there's a world political leader, the Antichrist, a world religious leader, the false prophet, a world religious system or a world religion where people are being forced to worship the Antichrist through the image of the Antichrist, the image of the beast. There is a world economic system or a global financial system where people are forced to receive the mark of the beast on the forehead or on the hands. And only with that mark, you can transact financially. You can buy or sell. Right? So all this is happening in the three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation. The whole world now is being brought in under the influence of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is backed up by the dragon, which is the devil. And he's supported on the earth by another man, the false prophet, a religious leader. And they're using religion and finance to control the world. And if you look at it today, religion and money, finance, are two very powerful control systems globally. Very powerful. Nations are controlled. By religions, religious systems, you know, even though uh, several nations claim to be secular, religion plays such a big part of how the nation is controlled. And if you look at it, if you if you can imagine it at a, at a, at a national level, at a nation level, then surely at a global level, something that is introduced uh, can, uh, as a religious system can be used to control people, masses of people. And of course, economic system. Today, uh, the financial system of the world is so interconnected. You know, you could make certain decisions here and impact people in another part of the world, as we are seeing happen how, you know, uh, European nations, North America, other nations getting together, making decisions and impact Russia economically, financially. I mean, like within two or three days, the impact was felt. You know, they made certain decisions. And in just two or three days, the, uh, the, the dollar ruble went up. Uh, the ruble, you know, just went up from almost, almost double, uh, a full 100%, almost. Uh, and then this is so many things, it impacted Russia so much. You know, just a matter of days, things change. So you can imagine how the economic system of the world is so connected. You make a decision somewhere to do certain things, it impacts globally. Yeah. So we are living in a time when what is written in Revelation 13 can literally be fulfilled like that. It's not, you know, we're not waiting for days for this to happen. No, a decision is made, the nations are affected. You know, it's so, um, we are living in such a time. Any questions before we get into chapter 14? Okay, so Revelation chapter 14 is um, an interesting chapter. It is what we would refer to as a chapter of announcements. That means this chapter um, uh, we are seeing we are seeing the 144,000 Jews, who remember in the beginning of the tribulation, on the first half of the tribulation, there were 144,000 Jews who were marked by God. So we said they were given the name of God and the, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, 
they, as we will see, they were servants of God. That means they were serving God in some way. These Jewish evangelists, as they are referred to sometimes, they are serving God. Now, these 144,000 Jews, we see them now in heaven. And then we see five angels who are making announcements to the earth. And each angel is saying something. They are warning the people on the earth. So that's chapter 14. It's a chapter of announcements where these angels are announcing to the people on the earth, warning them of what is about to come. Right. So let's read um, uh, Revelation 14 piece by piece. Could somebody read for us the first five verses? Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, please. Yes, sir. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him were hundred and forty uh, forty four thousand having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and I like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four, four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the one. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb whenever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits of God and to the Lamb, and in their mouths was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Mm. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5, the focus now is on the 144,000 Jews. Now, uh, they are, so John sees this vision a lamb. He sees a lamb. That's, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's representing the Lord Jesus Christ. So he sees the Lord. And then he sees Mount Zion. So obviously, this is not physical Mount Zion on the earth as Jerusalem. But this is Mount Zion in heaven, a heavenly Mount Zion. So, you know, there is this parallel that we see in the New Testament. There is the earthly Jerusalem, there's the heavenly Jerusalem, there's the earthly Mount Zion, and there's a the heavenly Mount Zion. We read about this in Hebrews chapter 12, the end of Hebrews 12. So when he says, I see the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, he's looking into heaven. He's seeing the Lord Jesus, he's seeing the heavenly Mount Zion, and then he sees these 144,000 Jews, and they are, you know, they are worshiping God. There is the sound of uh, harps playing, uh, being played, and they're they are singing a new song uh, before the throne. So obviously this is uh, the scene in heaven. And uh, there are these four living creatures, which we uh, read often earlier about. And uh, they're singing the song. And it says, you know, it's a very special song because only these 144,000 uh, uh, Jews are singing. But now we see, we, we see some things about the 144,000 Jews. It says that, they had not defiled themselves with women, verse 4. Uh, that means they were unmarried, single men, 144,000 single men, Jewish, all around the world. And they followed the Lamb wherever He goes. So that means they were followers of Jesus Christ. So these 144,000 Jews were actually Jewish believers in Jesus Christ. They were single men. They were followers of Jesus Christ. And it also says 
they were redeemed from men, from among men. So it says this twice. End of verse 3, it says they were redeemed from the earth. Uh, end of verse 4, it says they were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Right? So we'll come to that. But before we go into that, just the next verse, verse 5, it says, In their mouth was no deceit, and they were without fault before the throne of God. So what do we know about these 144,000 Jews as men, as people on the earth? They were single men. They were believers in Jesus. They lived honest, or you say, lives of great integrity. Verse 5, there was no deceit in their mouth. They were without fault before the throne of God. They lived these powerful lives. And, uh, you know, we can take it that being followers of Jesus Christ during the tribulation, they were bearing witness to Jesus Christ. Right? They followed the Lamb wherever. He, you know, that means they just they were faithful to the Lamb of God all their lives. So these are 140,000 Jews. But it also says they were redeemed from the earth. They were redeemed from among men as the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. So that is something we have to think about. What does that mean? Now, the question is, if these 144,000 Jewish men were on the earth and they were sealed by God and uh, they lived these righteous lives and that uh, they, um, you know, they followed Christ and they were believers in Christ, how did they get into heaven? Because John is seeing them in heaven, on Mount Zion, before the throne of God, along with the elders, uh, worshipping God, singing a new song with the sounds of harp. Uh, he's seeing them in heaven. And this is in the second half of the tribulation. So Revelation 7, we read about them in the first half of the tribulation. Revelation 14, we read about them in the second half of the tribulation. The question is, how do they get to heaven? There are two possible uh, choices. One is, either they were killed during the tribulation for their faith in Christ. They died. And they were resurrected, taken into heaven. Or, they were raptured and taken into heaven. God could rapture them and just take them up, like how we read about the rapture of um, the uh, the church in First Thessalonians four and First Corinthians fifteen. It's, it's possible, or if we see uh, how the two witnesses were killed and they were resurrected and raised up, he could have done the same with these 144,000 Jews. So it's not clearly given how they went. So we, it's, you know, it's only a, you know, a good guess, I could say, that, uh, you know, we could say it's most likely like this. Now, the word first fruits may give us an indication. The word first fruits in other places in the New Testament is one in James chapter one, verse, I think it's verse 18, uh, it's used uh, to talk about being born again, first fruits. In First Corinthians 15th chapter, it's used to talk about physical resurrection, the resurrection of Christ, first fruits. So if we go by that, um, and we also go by this whole thing about being redeemed from among men, because we read it earlier in Revelation um, uh, uh, chapter 7, when it talks about uh, and these others who, uh, were the, who Revelation 7, 14, who have come out of the great tribulation, um, you know, uh, it, it is possible, it is possible that just going by the word first fruits and by the fact that they were redeemed from among men, we could say that these 144,000 Jews were probably killed during the tribulation and then were raised up or they were just 
rapture right away. Now, in uh, Revelation 9 and uh, verse, verse 4, Revelation 9 verse 4, uh, when we read about this uh, fifth angel, the, this angel was commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have a seal of God on their foreheads. So, Revelation 9 4. This, um, it seems to indicate, Revelation 9 verse 4, that having the seal of God on their foreheads, which these 144,000 Jews have, protected them from harm and death. It seems like it. So that could give a little weightage to the, the idea that maybe this 144,000 Jews were just raptured, taken up into heaven. That's one way of looking at it. Or maybe God just allowed them to be killed for their faith and then raised up their bodies as first fruits, right? We don't know, and you will find uh, people having both of these points of view. And uh, some people even refer to this as a mid-tribulation rapture, the 140,000 Jews being raptured. So therefore they extend it and say, okay, you know, the, the rapture would happen in the middle of the tribulation because these 144,000 Jews were first fruits raptured into heaven, etc. My thought is all of that is good guesses, right? We are guessing at that point because we don't know for sure. Uh, we all we what we know for sure is these 144,000 Jews are up in heaven and they're worshiping God in Revelation 14. How exactly did they go up? Did they die and then resurrect? Did they, were they just raptured and go up into heaven? We're not very sure. And so we just, you know, we look at possible options. We consider possible options and we leave it at that. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody could say definitively that this is the way it'll happen. You know, we, we, could, we could do our best uh, what to say, guess, and say these are the possible options, how they would go to heaven, okay? So that is Revelation 14, verse 1 to 5, okay? But what we know for sure is in the second of the tribulation, 144,000 Jews are taken out of the earth. They are in heaven. Then we see, starting from verse 6, we see five angels making announcements to people on the earth. So let's read uh, portion by portion. Could somebody read verses six and seven, please? Revelation 14, six and seven, please. So that's our Thomas. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, please. Yeah, so I to... yeah. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwelt in the earth, on the earth, to every nation tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour is a hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and spring of water. Mm. So Revelation 14, 6 and 7, now John is saying, he sees another angel who is Proclaiming the everlasting gospel 
to those who dwell on the earth, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And he is telling them to fear God and give glory to God. So God is using an angel during this tribulation period, Revelation 14, to warn people, to proclaim the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So think about it. Now, we know typically the responsibility of preaching the gospel is given to the church, generally speaking. It is the church who has a responsibility. And the church has fulfilled the responsibility and it's proclaimed the gospel to all nations on the earth. The church has been taken out of the way, taken into heaven. And here in the middle of the tribulation, Revelation 14, there are lots of people who are dying for their faith in Christ. They believe in Jesus, they die. Of course, they will be doing something, their part, to testify to Christ because they are the testimony of Jesus Christ. But in addition to that, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, God is sending an angel messenger to go to all the nations, tribe and tongue, and preach to those who dwell on the earth. How exactly this is going to happen? How exactly is going to be? We don't know. Uh, could there be an angel, a single angel? Or could there be a company of angels? Or is it, you know, in, in what way is God going to do this, that uh, people on the earth are warned to fear God and to glorify him? Uh, because the judgment is coming. That's verse 7. Right? So God is sending angels to do this work at that time. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. So people are being warned. The gospel is being proclaimed all across the earth. So obviously, if the gospel is being proclaimed, it means people will be saved. There will be those who hear the gospel and respond to the gospel during the tribulation and they will be saved. Then there's another angel doing something. So let's read verses 8. Uh, verse, let's read verse 8. Revelation 13, 14, verse 8, please. What does the second angel do? Thomas? Um. Saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the spring of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, to the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of the fornication. Mm. So in verse 8, the second angel is announcing, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Because all nations were drinking of the wine, were made to drink of that wine. So this angel is announcing in advance the fall of Babylon. Now, what is this Babylon? We will get to see in chapters 17 and 18. And basically what we will understand as we go through 17 and 18 is chapter 17 is announcing the fall of that world religious system, which this false prophet, <coughs> sorry, which this false prophet had introduced. That is also referred to as mystery Babylon that falls, that collapses. And in chapter 18, this world economic system that had been introduced, also collapses. That is referred to as the great city Babylon because it's talking about buying and selling and commerce. So that collapses. So both the mystery Babylon representing the world religious system and the city Babylon representing the economic system, both these collapse, chapter 17 and 18. 
But now here in Revelation 14, verse 8, the angel is announcing ahead of time, Babylon has fallen. It's telling, you know, it's kind of telling people, look, this thing is going to collapse. It's going to go away. Right? Then there's a third angel um, who is making uh, uh, another announcement. So let's read verses 9 to 13, please. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 13. Kanan, is your mic okay to read? I'm not sure. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 13. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Revelation 14. 9 to 13. I'll read. Um, then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who died in the Lord from now on. Now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Mm. Thank you. So this third angel is warning the people, saying, don't receive the mark of the beast and don't worship the image of the beast. Because if you do that, you are going to be torment. You're going to go to the lake of fire, right? And you will be dismissed from God's presence. So this angel is warning people, don't receive the mark of the beast. Don't worship the image of the beast. And, uh, uh, and then it says, you know, verse 12, this is the endurance that if you keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, you'll be blessed who die in the Lord from now on. Right? So in other words, obviously refusing to worship the image of the beast or refusing to receive the mark of the beast is going to result in death. We saw that in chapter 13. It's going to kill everyone who refuses to do this. But then the angel is encouraging, saying, look, this is your hope or this is your endurance. This is what, you know, if you keep the commandments of the Lord and faith of Jesus, you are blessed if when you die in the Lord from now on. That means you're refusing to receive the mark of the beast. You're refusing to worship the image of the beast. If you die, you're blessed. You're going to be with God in heaven. So the angel is warning the people. Okay. Again, it's telling us, so, so this, all of this is very indicative or very clearly indicative that there will be people during the great tribulation, even in the, during the second half of the tribulation, who will hear the gospel and who will believe in Jesus Christ and who will die for Christ. They will be killed, but they will die in faith for Jesus Christ. Now, the next angel. So there are two more angels, right? So we've gone to, we've heard three angel announcements. Two more are there. Let's please read verses 14 to 16, Revelation, the 14th chapter, verses 14 to 16, Thomas.
Revelation chapter 14, uh, verses 14 through 16. Our uh, prince, maybe you could read it. Yes, sir. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a serp, scale, and another angel come out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thirst in your sick, uh, scale, and uh, for the time, for the time has come for you to rep for the the harvest of the earth is rape. So he who sat on the cloud does uh, dust in his scale Sickle. on the earth, sickle on the earth, and the earth was. Right. Right. All right, so John is saying, he is saying Jesus, the Son of Man, that's Jesus, that's the term used for Jesus, with a golden crown. So Jesus is enthroned, he's glorified, he's sitting on the cloud, and he's got a sharp sickle in his hand. Now the sickle is a harvesting tool, you know, where you go and cut, in the, cut the harvest in the fields, the farmers use that. He used the sickle to reap the harvest. And he is seeing Jesus with his crown, sitting on the throne, ready with the sickle. He's going to get the harvest. Now, in the Bible, harvest is a prophetic symbol of salvation of souls, of souls being saved, of souls uh, being reaped for the kingdom of God. Okay, um, I see that note from Thomas. It's a little noisy there. Okay, that's fine. No problem. So, uh, um, um, so Jesus is ready for the harvest. So, Revelation 14, 14 to 16, the angel is basically telling us, at that point in the tribulation, there's going to be a rich harvest of souls. The Lord puts in the sickle. And the earth was reaped. That means there's going to be a big ingathering of souls in the second half of the tribulation. The gospel is being preached. Angels are warning. And people are going to believe in Jesus Christ. Of course, there is this antichrist. There is this false prophet. They're deceiving the nations. And many people are subscribing to the Antichrist. Many people are believing the false prophet and all that's happening. But at the same time, the Lord Jesus is reaping a great harvest of soul. There will be people who will, um, like we read there in verse uh, 12, they will keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus in that triple. They'll keep it. And it's saying here in Revelation 14, 14 through 16, the son of man sitting on the golden crown. He is the Lord of the harvest. And he's going to reap a great harvest. So many souls will be saved during the second half of the tribulation. And then the last part of Revelation 14. Let's finish this. I think we can. Revelation 14, verses 17 to 20. I will read it and I will just comment on it. So this is the fifth angel. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of the wine of the earth, for a grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the wine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came up out of the winepress up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 furlongs. So, verses 17 to 20 is the fifth angel. What does the fifth angel do? He says, you know, he sees another angel holding the sickle, but this one is gathering grapes. Grapes being thrown into the winepress. So this is prophetic image of judgment. 
because in the wine press, the grapes are crushed. It's basically in those days, people would walk, you know, walk on their, with their feet and they will crush the grapes. They will trample the grapes and, you know, to, to get the grape juice out. So that is symbolic of judgment. And so this in Revelation 14, 17 to 20 is a, is a picture of the wine press of the wrath of God. Um, that's how it ends in verse 19. The great wine press of the wrath of God. This is judgment time. And uh, uh, verse 20 gives us some information. It says, the wine press was trampled outside the city. The city, of course, referring to Jerusalem. That means there's going to be this judgment taking place outside the city of Jerusalem. That's the place of judgment, where judgment is going to happen. And when the judgment of God happens in that place outside the city of Jerusalem, what's going to happen? Blood is going to flow as high as a horse's bridle, which is about four uh, feet high. It's going to flow for 1,600 furlongs, about 184 miles, close to 200 miles. Then there's going to be so much of bloodshed. It's going to flow as high as a horse's bridle, about four feet off the ground, for 200 miles. Uh, and of course, we don't know how wide it is, but... The point is, outside the city of Jerusalem is where this great and final judgment of God is going to take place. There's going to be so much of bloodshed, it's, it's going to flow like a river for about 200 miles. So that's the fifth angel. He's announcing this is what's going to happen. So in closing, Revelation 14, there are five angels making announcements. What did, what did we see? First angel is proclaiming the gospel so that people can get saved. Second angel is warning that Babylon is going to fall. That is, this one world religion and one world economic system is going to collapse. The third angel is telling people, don't receive the mark of the beast. It's better to die. You'll be blessed if you die, but don't receive the mark of the beast. It's better to die for obeying the commandment of God and your faith in Jesus. The fourth angel is announcing that there's going to be a great harvest of souls. So a lot of people will be saved. The fifth angel is announcing the judgment of God is going to happen outside of the city of Jerusalem. And it's going to result in a lot of bloodshed. It's going to be so much bloodshed that it's going to flow, like blood is going to flow like a river for 200 miles. That judgment is coming. It's going to happen just outside the city of Jerusalem. We will see in Revelation 16 what how that that's going to happen. That basically is the battle of Armageddon uh, outside of Jerusalem. The, 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 the battle of Armageddon will take place. Okay. So we have covered till the end of Revelation chapter 14. And I hope things are very clear. If you have any questions, we will take them next week. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting just going chapter by chapter, seeing all that has been given to us. Let's close in prayer. I want to thank you for listening patiently and journeying through the book of Revelation. Uh, could somebody close in prayer and we will dismiss. Prince, would you pray and we will dismiss, please. Yes. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you. Uh, you help us to learn that your word uh, from the book of Revelation that will reveal us uh, all these things uh, for you. Lord, uh, we believe that you're working in our hearts so that we can worship you and we can uh, continuously connect with you, Lord. Thank you for the coming days. Revelation will come, uh, but your power, you're empowering us uh, so that we can preach, uh, we can uh, uh, live forever with you, Lord. Thank you. I also pray for Pastor and uh, those who uh, we attend the class, uh, bless us in this time, and also submit all things in your hand in the jesus name i pray amen amen thank you thank you everyone god bless i'll see you in the next class bye now thank you